Is there a God? What are human beings? These questions obsess me, haunt me. Nothing could be more important, but can progress be made in answering them? One approach is to pressure the concepts God and human by seeking conflict or contradiction between them. Take the tension between human free will and God's knowledge of the future. It's called God's foreknowledge, God knowing now what will happen later. And here's the conflict. If God knows today what I will do tomorrow, say check my emails at 8 o'clock tomorrow, because God believes this statement about the future today, and because God to be God can never be wrong, then how on earth could I not check my emails at 8 o'clock tomorrow? This conflict threatens free will or God's foreknowledge or threatens both. Can free will survive God's foreknowledge? I'm Robert Lawrence Kuhn, and Closer to Truth is my journey to find out. One does not have to believe in God to appreciate how philosophers of religion seek to solve puzzles of God and free will. Even imagining a supreme being, a greatest possible being, subjects free will to extreme conditions, which may reveal free will's inner workings. That's why I love this conflict between free will and God's foreknowledge. To find out more, I go to the University of St. Thomas in St. Paul, where philosophers of religion gather for a Theology of Free Will workshop. I start more generally with how God, if there is a God, interacts with humans. I meet a Rutgers philosopher of religion, a theist who appreciates this tension between free will and God's foreknowledge, Dean Zimmerman. To me, this tension is terrific. Dean, free will is a wonderful probe of consciousness, what it means to be human. It's difficult enough by itself. But when we add a God and theism, it now changes the landscape of what free will is. Now, obviously, there are many different understandings of what it means to be God uh, involved in human life. Uh, what's the landscape of the different theological positions as it impacts free will? So on the, on the one extreme uh, associated with Calvin, you have the conception of God's sovereignty and God's control as uh, absolutely complete and everything that happens is just an outworking of God's commands. On this conception, you still get people trying to show us to be responsible for what we do, even though God is, in some sense, is behind the whole show. That seems pretty tough. It is tough. Uh, it, it's very hard to see how, how the two could be true. That I'm responsible, pretend for a moment that Adam was the first human being and fell, uh, did something terrible. Well, if God foreknew that that was going to happen and intended it to happen and caused it to happen, it's very hard to understand how in the world God could hold Adam responsible. And in the extreme positions, it's uh, my calling, my salvation has been determined by God, absolutely. And so how, how then can I have any say in my ultimate destiny if God has determined that before my birth? My, my reaction to that is you couldn't. <laughs> that, that there's just an incoherence in this, in this idea. That, but some do try to defend it. But some do they try to defend it. They have to because otherwise God would be a monster. Right. So there's this other extreme that though God is all-knowing in the sense that he knows everything that's true, there's facts about the future that God has left open. And there's no fact of the matter about it. So God is still omniscient. God still knows everything because the future facts are not something that you can know. Right. And then in between, in this landscape, you have people who want a bit of both. They want to say, God knows everything that will happen. And nevertheless, we genuinely generate free choices from time to time, at least. Uh, and are held responsible for those, and God doesn't determine what we do on those occasions. And in this middle terrain, you've basically got two positions. One of them, which I'll call simple foreknowledge, is in a way closer to open theism. 
simple foreknowledge just says, God simply foreknows what people are going to freely do. And he foreknows it because he sees it, not because he knew that if you were in this situation, you would freely do this, but if you were in this slightly different situation, you would freely do that. Fairly close to Calvinism, you have a view that, that's called Molinism. It's the view that uh, God can know what creatures would freely do under various circumstances, and then he gets to decide whether to put them in those circumstances or not. However, on this view, God never causes anybody to have to freely do such and such. So where does Dean Zimmerman fit on this uh, trajectory? I tend towards the open theist uh, <laughs> side uh, of, the, of the spectrum. Um, I think the things that drive people towards Calvinism are concern for God's absolute sovereignty, absolute control over everything. I don't think that that conception of free will makes sense. I think that to be the greatest possible being, you don't have to control everything and make everything happen. Um, the greatest possible being might be a, a being who makes room for other beings to have responsibility and who works through uh, uh, risky relationships. So you would weaken God's sovereignty in order to strengthen human freedom? I would say that it's worth it to God to let go of the reins to some extent in order to have real significant relationships with uh, creatures who can be more than just puppets but uh, can be even God's friends. I'd like reality to be like that, privileging human freedom over God's control. I'd like a creator, if there is a creator, to be willing, to be desirous of seeding power for the purpose of creating truly free creatures. But still, the stark conundrum remains. If God really knows the future, then how can we be really free? Does the question just hang there, or can more be said? I asked philosopher David Hunt, who is writing a book on this classic struggle between divine foreknowledge and human free will. So there are a lot of different problems involving God's foreknowledge, but the one that I'm focused on involves propositional uh, knowledge, knowledge of propositions. Divine foreknowledge will be a knowledge of propositions about the future, and an omniscient being has to know all truths. So if there's divine foreknowledge, there must be truths about the future. There have to be truths about the contingent future, uh, a future that could go either way but happens to go this way, if God's foreknowledge is to be complete and exhaustive. The question is, is, is that a truth? Is that proposition a, a true today, or yeah. is, is, it, is, is there no truth about that matter? Yeah, yeah. I mean, exactly. God's foreknowledge will force him to know it only if there's a truth there. <laughs> yeah. right? But if there is a truth there, then for sure God has to know it. He has to know it, yeah. Uh, and it seems obvious to me that there are future contingent truths, but what's obvious to one uh, isn't always easy to explain because there are others for whom it's not so obvious. So what do I say to those people? Yeah, well, and this thing is, it's, not, it's not so obvious to me. Well, because, that's good to know, yeah. Yeah, because you have the assumption that the, the future is sort of set in a, in almost a four-dimensional block. But does the whole future of reality uh, all uh, exist at one time in a four-dimensional space-time slicing? I start off with future contingent truth almost as a, as a datum. I take the rather simple view that uh, truth is omnitemporal. If you have the truth conditions for a present tense proposition, say, I am sitting in this chair now, mm -hmm. uh, whatever those truth conditions are, those are the truth conditions for the corresponding past and future tense propositions. So 
given that I'm sitting in the chair now, that renders the present tense proposition, I am sitting in this chair now, true. But it also means that the future tense proposition someone might have uttered five minutes ago, that David Hunt will be sitting in that chair, that the very same truth conditions render that future tense proposition true, and the very same truth conditions render the past tense proposition someone might yes. utter five minutes from now. True. Each of those uh, have different characteristics, the mm -hmm. present, the past, and the future. Yes. I think we'd all agree that the present is very much grounded, and I think that we can come to a similar, but perhaps not exactly the same argument for the past, but the future is is not that obvious to yes. me that that you that you get to the same conditions even though you sitting in the chair five minutes from now would fulfill the the truth or falsity of the proposition today mm -hmm. of where you'll be in five minutes yeah but it still doesn't have uh, you know the same uh, epistemic mm -hmm. uh, strength it's more wispy it's different because it sure seems like there's something special about the present. Presentism is precisely the metaphysical view that there is something special about the present. What's special about the present is that only the present is real. Mm -hmm. If presentism is true, and if furthermore, truth is a correspondence between a proposition and the world, <laughs> correspondence between a proposition and something that is real, mm -hmm. then if the future isn't real, there can't be any truths about right, it. Right, and God is no, no poorer in his omniscience by not knowing it. Because there's no truth there, yeah. right? Omniscience doesn't require it. I think a majority of philosophers support the omnitemporality of truth, and that would be my position. That would support there being future contingent and, truths. And, and, but, because the problem is a problem of divine foreknowledge uh, and human freedom. It's propositional foreknowledge. So that foreknowledge doesn't exist if there are no true propositions about the future. So I face a choice. If there are no future contingent truths, which means there is no present fact to know now about the future, then God cannot have foreknowledge and free will can be real. But if there are future contingent truths, which means there are present facts to know now about the future, then the conflict is real, and for the theist, terrible. I appreciate the desire of theists to maximize God's control, to make sure God fulfills God's plan so that all turns out well, yet at the same time to require robust free will to justify human moral responsibility and God's righteous judgment. But each side, God's foreknowledge and human free will, pulls in opposite directions, increasing the tension. Mustn't one side give a little, weaken its rigidity? But if weaken even a little, would it not fall apart entirely? This problem is not new. One of the pioneers was St. Anselm in the 11th century. I ask Anselm expert, Kate Rogers. Kate, how do we get real human freedom if God controls everything that happens? I'm looking at St. Anselm of Canterbury, and I think he gives maybe the, the best answer. Uh, he sets himself a really difficult problem because he thinks that everything in the universe that has real uh, ontological status, that is everything that really exists, right. is immediately caused by God from moment to moment. So, you know, how in the world can there be a, a space for uh, human freedom in there? And his answer, uh, in, in a nutshell, is that God gives human beings competing motivations such that the human agent is, in the final analysis, the one that chooses between the competing motivations. So all the human being contributes is just pursuing one God-given motive over another, but, but that, that little tiny space of pursuing one motive over another, that's really and absolutely up to the human agent. And, and that's actually a very radical thing to say because the, the upshot is God causes every thing that exists but he doesn't cause everything that happens. 
human freedom is, you know, something that happens and not caused by God. First, let's look at uh, the God causing every event. But what is actually happening? Well, I mean, here you are debating, should I do A, should I do B? And there's this moral significance mm -hmm. to A and B. God causes your, your being sort of in the condition where you're able to opt for one or the other, mm -hmm. but you're ultimately opting for one or the other. God doesn't cause that. So there's, there's an event which I'm gonna say doesn't have any ontological status. It's not some kind of real thing, because worthy God, of the name thing. Because God causes everything, yeah, so it can't yeah, be that. Yeah, so I can't say that, but if I say, or if you know, I following Anselm, say, look, God leaves you this little tiny space where you can pursue the motive for A over right. the motive for B, and it has moral significance and it was really up to you, then, that means that you're the one who's ultimately responsible for that, that just opting for one over the other. What I really like about it is it really gives you what we call libertarian freedom. Yeah, it is, it, it's a libertarian because view. Because it really yeah. gives you the option of could have done otherwise if that's what yeah. you're telling me, I mean, if I have that option of, of, of one or the other. Yeah. So I'm happy with that, <laughs> but, I, but that obviously <laughs> makes the problem a lot harder. You got your libertarian freedom by definition, but now you have to reconcile that with this concept that God causes every event, but God is not um, making a decision in that small yeah. space. But see, I'm, I'm denying that God causes every event. I'm, I'm saying that he causes everything that has real existence and that, and, and maybe he causes every event except <laughs> The opting, you're opting for A okay. over so, B. So, uh, so I'm, so I'm. I mean, and and that's where it's radical. I mean, Anselm, Anselm is saying God is not the cause of every event. Because if He were, then you'd have to say stuff like God caused the act of sin. But you're opting for A over B, or, or for B over A. When and you really, in the absolute sense, could have gone one way or another. That was up to you. All caused by God, but still a little tiny space for us to act freely? Hmm, but what actually is that little tiny space? No one can say. There's a real problem here. Harmonizing human free will and God's foreknowledge doesn't seem to work. None of the attempted solutions survive analysis. Perhaps the most pointed part of God's foreknowledge deals with ultimate concerns, God's final reward or punishment. The Christian term is salvation. Some theologians claim that God predestines salvation, that God decides ahead of time, even before the foundations of the world, who makes it and who doesn't. But if predestination, how then free will? I ask a professor of moral theology, an expert on predestination, Jesse Kuvenhoven. Predestination is really the idea that sometime before history, God has made a plan that covers the whole of history and that throughout time then, God is trying to make history conform to that plan. So then the question is, how would that work? In what way can we still have genuine agency and some kind of authority of our own if God is the one who seems to be telling the story of the universe, as it were? Well, so the plan that is addressed by the question of predestination is really the plan of salvation, the question of who ultimately is going to be in a positive relationship with God. And so traditionally, there are different ways of thinking about what it would mean for God to be predestining one concept called single predestination, and it's just that God is really just focused on the ones that God wants to have an eternally positive relationship with, so that the plan that God makes is for certain individuals to be with God, and God is enacting that plan. But there might be all sorts of other things that are happening in the universe, and then there are disputed views about this. Maybe one possibility would be God doesn't 
really do much. They kind of are on their own. So you could have the possibility that some of the people that God did not predestine still make it in somehow if they have their own individual libertarian freedom of choice where they get to decide, do I love God or not? Those seem like the better guys because they, they weren't forced to do it. God, they have, God, right? God, God controlled the others and they got in with, by, by robotic technique, but those other guys, I like those, they're better. Yeah, now it's possible to think of predestination in a way that allows everybody this kind of freedom of choice. So one traditional kind of definition of what it is for God to predestine basically includes God's foreknowledge and then suggests that God, on the basis of God's foreknowledge, has a plan for your life that's already based on what he foresees that you will choose independently on your own, as it were. But that's not really predestination, and that's sort of foreknowledge uh, under the cloak of predestination. Well, that is certainly what those who are influenced by St. Augustine would say. It's not real predestination. So you know, we, anyway, we have a single uh, definition of, of single form right, predestination. Right, right, right. There must be, if it's a right, single, so there must be a double. Right, there's a double. So, uh, yeah, so the other possibility is um, God elects before the creation of all things that some people will be in and some people will be out. So uh, making an affirmative out decision. Yeah, right. So that would be the strongest possible version of the double predestination is that there will be a definite intentionality to who's in and who's out. Now, what is obvious from all of this is that to gain the, the so-called good of God's sovereignty, you're giving up a huge amount in human freedom. Well, I think the answer to that is yes and no. I guess I'm not convinced that we're giving up that much if human beings don't have that many undetermined free choices. I'm a kind of compatibilist, right? I think that you can be free, but also be ne under necessity of a certain sort. Right, so there could right? be a determined series of physical laws or God could make the- Just make stuff happen. Yeah, yeah. And then it's even more sure because it's God doing it. Right. Uh, but the, 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 the real core of the question is, do you have a, an ultimate choice or is it 100% sure that you have to go the way God programmed you? Right, for Augustine, there would definitely at least be instances where you definitely had to go the way God right. programmed you. And do you think predestination is fair? If that's the way the world is, would that be a world you'd like to live in? I think possibly yes. We tend to think that it's always would be problematic if we don't have control, but think about something like falling in love for instance. But the difference here is that when God decides it, it's, it's done, it's absolute. It's multiple handcuffs on every, every cell of your, of your existence. And, and if you're chosen, well, I mean, you may not have free will, but at least you're, you, you get something to benefit by, supposedly. Uh, but, it, but if you're on, on the other side, uh, th that's the question. Is that fair? Or maybe God doesn't have to be fair. A lot of these authors classically did not think that God had obligations or responsibilities because God is generator mm. of obligations and responsibilities. If God, especially under double predestination, determines that person B is, is going to not be part of the saved, whatever that may mean, yes. um, is that fair to the person? And if you're a genuinely responsible agent, then it can be fair to blame you for things even if you're not independent in the way that the kind of freedom of choice conception of free will might want you to be. But so these questions about predestination really do open up fascinating avenues into the issues of, of free will. The freedom of the human will and God's foreknowledge of the future are two pillars of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And the conflict between them is a problem for theism. Because God, to be God, can never be wrong. And because God's knowledge now includes statements about future events, therefore those future events cannot change, how then free will? Giving God full sovereignty and humans full freedom may be theologically desirable, but it is logically challenging. How can God enable full free will in our present while still keeping full providential control of our future? Try as one might, one simply cannot have humans maximally free and God maximally knowledgeable. Predestination is even worse. 
For God to assign ultimate fates, who's in and who's out, seems blatantly unfair. There's no scarcity of theological explanations for free will. From open theism, where there are no facts about the future to now know, even for God, to theological compatibilism, where even though humans cannot do other than that which God already knows, humans are still in some sense free because their actions are not determined by external forces. A solution, if there is a solution, must weaken either human freedom or God's foreknowledge. Take your choice, getting closer to truth. For complete interviews and for further information, please visit closertotruth.com. This program was supported in part by a grant from the John Templeton Foundation.